I would like to introduce Dr. Doug Wood, Chair of the Department of Surgery. He's going to give us an update on the search. So good morning. So I wanted to come in, I won't take up too much of your time, but wanted to give you an update of where we are in the search for my new Chair of Medicine. And obviously, can't think of anything more important that, we're, uh, that we are doing. And we're making excellent progress. So. Uh, many of you know, if you've been keeping track of my updates by email or updates here, that we have four uh, finalist candidates, um, and they are uh, Dr. Monica Kraft, who's a, a Chair of Surgery at the University of Arizona, Dr. Barbara Young, who is Chief of the Division of Gastroenterology at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Dr. Sanjay Saint, who's a Chief of Medicine at the uh, Ann Arbor VA at University of Michigan, uh, and Dr. Neil Poe, who, who is uh, the Chief of Medicine, the San Francisco Chair at UCSF. Um, and uh, two of them have already been here, Dr. Monica Kraft and uh, Dr. Barbara Young have uh, been here in the first and second week of April, respectively. Dr. Sanjay Saint is here today and tomorrow. Uh, so my first meeting today was with Dr. Saint. Uh, so he's just getting started and will be, be meeting with many of you. Uh, and one of the things that I want to encourage you to attend, if you're able to, is uh, the town halls. We've been having a town hall for each of these candidates. Um, this is an open forum for any of you to attend, uh, and I encourage you to, where the candidate will take a few minutes to explain themselves, their vision, what their priorities are, but then it's open for questions. Uh, so it's an open forum that's also available by Zoom if you're not able to be there uh, in person and the Department of Medicine has all of that information and links. It's at 5 o'clock tomorrow in D209. So uh, uh, that's where the town hall is and I encourage you to be there. Uh, and then Dr. Neil Poe, um, I'm announcing today we, that's been confidential until now uh, for a, a variety of reasons, but I want to let you know that uh, Dr. Poe will be visiting next week and will be uh, going through some of the same process. There will also be a town hall for him, so pay attention to that, and uh, I hope you can come for his uh, open forum as well. So that's an update. I uh, expect that we should be giving um, uh, recommendations to Dr. Ramsey in the beginning of May and uh, letting then Dr. Ramsey take it from there. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the icons of diabetes, Dr. Matt Riddle. Matt is one of the few English majors I know who went into medicine and now that I think about it, he's one of the few English majors I've ever met. He graduated with his English degree from Yale, went to medical school at Harvard, did his internal medicine training in Chicago, and did his endocrine training both at Rush in Chicago and here at the University of Washington. He has been at OHSU in Portland since 1973, and over the years he has been one of my role models as the iconic triple threat. He has evolved into the premier clinical trialist in the world of type 2 diabetes, particularly as it pertains to insulin management. I should also point out that as current editor of Diabetes Care, under his leadership, this journal has become the most prominent clinical diabetes journal in the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Riddle to the University of Washington. Well, thank you, Earl. That's a very kind welcome. It, it does make me nervous to be referred to as an icon. That doesn't sound all good. I'm not sure. Um, but this feels uh, like home here. I spent two very important years of my life here, uh, 1971 to 73, and I've been back over the years. I have many friends, and thank you so much for inviting me to, to come. Um, because I know you've heard a lot about uh, diabetes in general and insulin included uh, from Dr. Hirsch, I feel I may be carrying coals to Newcastle here. So I decided to try to structure my comments um, around some practical questions that come up 
uh, in clinical practice for most uh, doctors in dealing with uh, diabetes every day. We have lots of tools and lots of information, but still um, there are decisions to be made, and I'm going to try to provoke you a little bit with a few uh, new pieces of information and, uh, and some maybe a little offbeat opinions. So this is your mountain, Mount uh, Rainier, uh, Tacoma, a God watching. Uh, and there's my institution, my uh, disclosures, and in the background, our mountain in Portland, that's Mount Hood, a more modest mountain, but still very uh, attractive volcano. So here are the clinical questions I'm going to be trying to comment on. So human insulin, what's the place for them, or is there a place? Uh, Premixed insulins. Um, where are they useful and where do they fit in? Um, basal insulins for type 2 diabetes, are the new ones uh, better? Uh, should we be using the new uh, ones more often? Um, and then finally, uh, how do we deal with the postprandial hyperglycemia that remains after basal insulin therapy and, and type 2 diabetes? So all of these are live topics. I also want to uh, show this slide, which I like. It assembles um, four Nobel Prize winner groups. Um, so insulin is a well-studied molecule, probably the best studied therapeutic agent, certainly in endocrinology, maybe in all fields. Um, we know a lot about it. Uh, and furthermore, um, the epidemiologists tell us, from the, the people from the CDC tell us, that in the, the U.S., um, the lifetime risk of developing diabetes for a person born at the turn of the, the century is one in three. And in some subgroup populations, it's more than that. So uh, diabetes is really common, and insulin deficiency is, is always present in diabetes. Um, insulin always works. Um, we have no surprises in the future, I think, about side effects of insulin. We know all about insulin. We're still debating about how to use it, though, and that's what I'm going to try to address. There's a lot that I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk very much about type 1 diabetes or about the devices um, or about uh, GLP-1 agonists in their combination with insulin, another important topic, uh, the combination regimens and CGM, all these things you've heard from Earl, I'm pretty sure. Um, but there's still a lot to talk about, so let's start with the human insulins. Can they still be useful, or if so, when? As you know, the congressional hearings are underway about uh, the prices of medications, and insulin is the poster drug for this um, discussion because it's essential for life uh, for people with type 1 diabetes, and the prices have gone up dramatically over the last uh, few years, and they continue to rise. Um, and there's a political, um, I don't know what to call it exactly, but there's ferment. Um, as to what can be done about this. And, and I'm going to show you, in addition to citing these um, recent papers, one of them in diabetes care uh, on behalf of the, the ADA's analysis of, of cost of insulin, um, and uh, two papers in which Dr. Hirsch participated um, about the difficulties, the moral and practical and medical difficulties of providing insulin to everybody who needs it around the world. Um, I'm going to give you a window into the money that underlies this problem. I, I dug these, uh, the data for this and the next two slides out of um, the Internet by way of Googling uh, the annual reports of uh, some large corporations. These are three uh, companies that make insulin, um, Novo Nordisk, Lilly, and Sanofi. And this is the direct data taken directly from their annual reports in billions of uh, financial units, uh, each according to the, the local currency, U.S. dollars for Lilly, um, uh, kroner, uh, Danish kroner for Novo, and uh, um, euros in the case of Sanofi. And at the bottom, I've tried to do my amateurish adjustment um, for the year 2018 um, to, to U.S. dollars. So the annual cash flow for the drug companies that make insulin ranges between 17 billion and 38 billion dollars a year. That's a lot of money, really a lot of money. But if you look at the pharmacy benefit managers who are the intermediaries between the drug companies and the use of uh, all pharmaceuticals in health systems, um, they, these are the three largest ones. They're all in the U.S. They basically don't exist outside the U.S. 
Um, and two of the three um, have uh, rising cash flows starting at $150 billion a year, much bigger than the drug companies, and rising at a pretty brisk rate over the last four years. And then there are also the wholesale pharmacies, which are just as big, or almost as big, as the uh, pharmacy benefit managers, and they actually handle the, the handling and actual distribution of the, of the drugs. And they, it's the same thing is true for them. Um, a lot of money is going there. It isn't all going to the drug companies. In fact, their cash flow is flat. And this is a youth, uniquely American phenomenon. And this is what the debate in Washington is all about. How are we going to cope with this drain of cash out of health care into another kind of business? So cost, cost of insulin. Um, human insulin costs, if you go to Walmart, uh, one-tenth as much as the list price for the other insulins. And so there are patients who are not using insulin who should be, and there are patients who must take insulin and who are rationing their doses because they can't afford to pay uh, the full cost of the full dose. Um, and for them, human insulin is a real realistic option. We used to use it back in the 1980s when I had, had put in my 10 years, first 10 years as running the diabetes clinic in, in Portland at our university. I, I thought I was pretty good at using insulin. Um, it took a long time to learn, though, and these were the kind of regimens that we used using human insulin for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Single dose, two doses, three doses, four doses. And of these, um, the ones that are at the bottom here, the three and four dose regimens, still work for type 2 diabetes very nicely, with the distribution of a larger dose of NPH at bedtime and regular insulin um, with meals, basically. So, in, for example, for a, fifth, a person with type 2 diabetes who is not very insulin resistant, who might need uh, uh, 20 units at bedtime uh, and 10 units with each of three meals, you can get pretty good control doing it that way. They're not available readily in pen injectors like the analogs, but it's certainly better than not taking insulin at all. And I think uh, our trainees ought to know about human insulin and how to use it. This has actually been um, a policy effort on the part of some health systems. This is one reported in a paper in JAMA just recently. Um, this was in, uh, in mostly in California, and I think uh, so, uh, some of the patients outside of, of uh, California as well. Uh, they had a large population of people who uh, had diabetes who were uh, Medicare age, uh, almost uh, 15,000 of them, and they were selected for needing more than uh, one injection of insulin, two or more injections of, of insulin, taking analog insulin at a high price to the institution and or them or both, um, and uh, in more than 50 units a day, and a history or at least suspected non-adherence, perhaps due to difficulty affording the insulin. The idea would be that the institution would save money um, and the patients would actually be able to take the dose, um, dose their full doses because they were uh, not rationing their insulin. They were also going to stop their analog, of course, uh, start human insulin and stop uh, sulfonuria if they were taking it. And this is what the patients looked like. These are pretty typical Medicare um, patients in the, in the U.S. Um, a third of them were taking sulfonurias, which they stopped. And I mention that because I think the stopping the sulfonuria may have interfered with the um, the better results that they might have had with better adherence with human insulin um, in the study. But the bottom line here is what they showed uh, was that by this systematic policy of, of uh, trying to persuade doctors and patients to switch from analog to human insulin in type 2 diabetes in older patients um, caused no harm, um, it worked fine. In other words, they could substitute without any, any difficulty, and it was a lot less costly. Now, the older human insulin regimens may also be appropriate for some kinds of uh, other patients, um, not just those who don't uh, uh, have good health insurance and can't afford the insulin. So these regimens that we used to use once daily or twice daily um, were with, with human insulin in the old days were all focused on treating daytime hyperglycemia. And there are patients with type 2 diabetes who have mainly daytime hyperglycemia. This includes those who are treated with glucocorticoids uh, given in the morning and have insulin resistance during the day. It includes um, 
people with gestational diabetes, women with gestational diabetes, and also includes quite a few patients with pancreatic diabetes who don't have overnight glucose control problems, but they do um, have difficulties um, uh, with daytime hyperglycemia. And just to illustrate the patterns that you see, this is a study that I and some colleagues in, uh, did in Portland and published just a few years ago, um, giving um, modest doses of prednisone in the morning uh, for three days um, before an admission to the CRC uh, to do glucose and other metabolic profiles in people who did not have diabetes, some with prediabetes and some with mild type 2 diabetes. And what's shown in the upper left here are the people with type 2 diabetes. And you see in a day without uh, prednisone uh, compared with a day with prednisone, there's a big escape of blood sugar um, a little after breakfast, partly due to insulin suppression, by the way, not just insulin resistance, and then a big peak in the day, middle of the day um, after lunch, and it's still high after dinner. That coincides with the profile of action of NPH insulin. And so either NPH or premix 70-30 human insulin given before breakfast is a great treatment for patients with this um, treatment situation who are taking glucocorticoids daily and have mild type 2 diabetes. This is another study from another group showing just exactly the same thing. At the bottom are people without diabetes, a 24-hour glucose profile. The middle curve is people without diabetes given prednisolone, very similar to prednisone in the morning, and uh, there's an elevation of the, of the glucose during the day, but not very much. But with type 2 diabetes, there's a big escape, again, with a pattern matching the profile of NPH insulin, which is really the most a sophisticated way to treat the hyperglycemia of a glucocorticoid exacerbated diabetes. So just to summarize, human insulin still does have a place, certainly where, it can't, where the other insulins aren't affordable, um, and probably for other kinds of diabetes where daytime hyperglycemia is a particular problem and the profile of action of NPH matches the needs. So premixed insulins. They're still very widely used around the world. In India and in China, for example, used extensively. In the U.S., less, in Europe, yet less, but still there are a lot of patients taking premixed insulin. So the rationale behind them um, I want to discuss and show you some data regarding that. So the rationale is that by taking two injections of a mixture of an intermediate and a rapid insulin, you get essentially um, a basal bolus regimen easily achieved with two separate injections. In other words, biphasic insulin given twice daily gives you four peaks. The trouble with that is that if you add up the insulin curves and look, measure the blood levels, that's not what you get. It's two monophasic peaks, one with each injection. And here's the direct experimental data to support that. And this is a CLAMP study done by uh, David Owen's group in, in Cardiff in the UK. Um, so at Novo Mix 30 and the, uh, the Lilly Lice Pro uh, uh, premixed, analog premix, um, will have curves like this. And you notice that the peaks of action occur at midday, lunchtime, and midnight, not exactly the time you want the peak effect to be. And this leads to problems. And to document the problems, as well as the success of premixed insulins, and to compare human versus analog premixed insulin. So I'm going to show you two studies, and they were done separately by the manufacturers of the two um, premixed formulations, um, but they have almost identical results. So this is the study done by Novo Nordisk, um, testing the effect of uh, ASPART 7030 versus human 7030 in type 2 diabetic patients with titration trying to optimize control. And these are the results. This is the 24-hour profile. Um, uh, self-measured um, eight-point profile, and uh, several points to make. Uh, the first is that there is a slight advantage in reducing the postprandial peak after breakfast and after dinner following each of the two injections, um, but it's a small difference. Um, the overall 24-hour patterns look about the same. The A1Cs are about the same. The A1Cs are also 8%. You don't get the 7% easily with premixed insulin, um, and at least uh, in the typical patient you don't. Um, and then there's the problem of hypoglycemia that prevents further titration. So midday hypoglycemia at lunchtime is a really common problem with the premixed insulins. 
So that's aspart premixed, and this is Lyspro premixed, and it's exactly the same pattern. A1C about 8%, uh, tendency to hypoglycemia in midday, also somewhat at night, but midday is the worst. So, um, to summarize, premixed insulins are not biphasic, they have a single peak after injection. Um, there is a slight advantage of the analog premix in reducing the immediate postprandial increment, but the overall effect is more similar than different when compared to human insulin. So if you're going to use premixed insulin, there's nothing wrong with using human premixed insulin. Um, and, they want, and the analog uh, premix is 10 times more expensive at the list price, um, or human premixed is one-tenth the cost. Now, the more practical, I think, for, for most doctors in practice um, question is, well, where might basal uh, insulin be better um, than premixed, or when is premixed better than basal insulin for initiating insulin therapy? That was the original idea in using premix. You could give twice daily and go essentially to full basal bolus therapy very easily. But since uh, the, uh, the good basal insulins have been available, there's been a move toward using basal. So here are two studies that show what happens when you compare starting with a, a basal um, analog, U100 glargine, versus starting with premixed um, insulin. And the studies differ in that this first one that's on the screen now uh, was done in Germany where the preference was to stop the oral agents at the time premixed insulin was started. Um, and they compared this to starting basal insulin while continuing the oral agents. And under these conditions, the results actually favored uh, the basal insulin um, in, term, not, in terms not only of hypoglycemia and weight gain, which were less with the, with the basal insulin, um, but the A1C was a little bit better. The, the two 24-hour uh, profiles shown below uh, show uh, an advantage of the basal over the, the premixed insulin. And this other study was done by Philip Raskin in Texas, and um, in the U.S. practice is to continue the oral agents um, in general. Um, and when basal insulin is started and versus twice daily premix is started, there's a slight advantage of A1C um, uh, reduction with the premix compared to the basal, um, but it's a small advantage. And uh, as again, there is more weight gain and more hypoglycemia with premixed insulin. So what about the question of uh, further enhancing the effect of basal insulin by adding uh, prandial dose? And that is what we have come to in our group and I think Dr. Hirsch's group um, as a better alternative to using premix twice daily. If you're going to use two injections, it's probably most practical and efficient to have a basal, a titrated basal dose for overnight in between meals, and then a single injection added to that with a dominant meal. So this study actually tests um, the practical situation that exists in clinical practice. Do you start, when you start insulin, do you start with premix twice daily and titrate it aggressively? Do you start with basal insulin and either stay with just the basal or maybe add a single injection with the dominant meal? Or do you go all the way to basal bolus if you need to? So those were the three arms of randomization here. And you look at the curve here, the A1C results were the, pretty much the same, well, all three ways. There was a slight advantage to the, the two basal um, regimens compared to the premixed regimen. At the, at the bottom you see 7.5% with premix uh, A1C attained at one year. Um, partly due to backing off on the dose because of hypoglycemia, partly because of a higher dropout rate. Um, and the other finding that's of interest and important, I think, is that under these conditions, at the time of the first need for injected therapy, injected, based, injected insulin, or any injected therapy, um, there's no advantage to going all the way to basal bolus therapy. We, we did it as a routine in the past, but we don't do it anymore. We do it with a single prandial injection. It's just as good as basal bolus under these conditions. And then here's the familiar problem of more weight gain and more hypoglycemia with premixed insulin. So to summarize this, basal versus premix for initiating insulin, the attained A1C is about the same, 
Um, but hypoglycemia and weight gain are routinely less with basal insulin initiation. And titration of a basal insulin dose is simple, and that's why it's been well accepted. Um, and then finally, if you don't get to your target A1C, below 7, below 7.5, 7 below 8, whatever you've decided is the target for that patient, then a single dose of uh, adding prandial insulin with the main meal is a very simple and logical way to go. And I'm coming back to that in a minute. So this gets us to the question that usually is the topic for a talk like this, and that is, what about the new basal insulins, which are being heavily promoted, which have had very um, uh, extensive and, and nicely done development programs showing um, their uh, pharmacokinetics, uh, the advantage in hypoglycemia, the ease in titration with the newer, even longer acting uh, basal insulins. Um, so what are the practicalities related to this? So first of all, these are the basal insulins we now have in the formulary. Human NPH, uh, Levomir, which um, is not quite a 24-hour insulin. It's a little longer maybe than human um, uh, NPH, but not much. Um, both of those need to be given twice daily for best effect. Uh, the other insulins, uh, insulin glargine uh, U100, that's Lantus or Basaglar, the new biosimilar version of it. Uh, it's about a 24-hour insulin or a little longer for most patients. Um, and then the longer than that insulins are uh, Tugeo and Traceba, which are respectively Glargine U300 formulation and Deglodec, and they're more than 24-hour duration. They all have the same therapeutic power. They all get the A1C down, um, but they cause uh, different degrees of hypoglycemia, and so that's the real question. Before I get into the hypoglycemia question, though, I want to just make a brief detour and talk about other safety issues. Um, there still are papers appearing in major medical journals uh, questioning the safety of insulin, arguing that insulin is dangerous, that it kills people, it increases cardiovascular risk, it causes fatal hypoglycemia um, unpredictably, um, and that it increases the risk of cancer, for example, breast cancer being uh, the one proposed from this epidemiologic study. And <clears throat> the authors in the quote at the top of this slide um, call for large randomized uh, controlled trials to investigate the effect of insulin on hard endpoints. Um, this publication was in 2014. Um, in 2012, um, we, that is to say, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Popesfield and I and a number of other collaborators, published the results of the origin study, which was uh, done by the Sanofi people. Um, it, looking for superiority of, of, of uh, Lantus, so insulin glargine, over uh, conventional oral therapy early in type 2 diabetes in high-risk cardiovascular patients, that is, early diabetes but high cardiovascular risk. It's a big study. It was 12,500 patients. It was a global study, follow-up for up to seven years with a mean median of five years. And the results are really helpful in this respect. There is no increase of cardiovascular risk from basal insulin, not even this one, which has been claimed specifically to be um, more risky. No cardiovascular risk, no increase in total mortality, no increase in cancer. No benefit compared to oral step therapy, but no risk either. Um, there was a reduction in conversion from uh, impaired glucose tolerance to overt diabetes, so that was a separate benefit, but, but there were no added risks. And furthermore, when you look at the actual glucose numbers uh, that were achieved in this study, 12% um, of the patients enrolled did not have diabetes. They had prediabetes. They had impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. Um, they're shown at the top here, and they had sensational glucose control throughout with oral step therapy or with glargine-based therapy, um, either one. The ones with diabetes had an average of five years of duration of diabetes, and that's... Um, that's about the time at which uh, two oral agents begin to fail. Um, and in this study, they came in at A1C of 6.5, and seven years later, they still had an A1C of 6.5. So you can maintain really good glucose control early without too much risk, either way. Um, but if, you, if insulin is used, it does not increase the cardiovascular risk. There was more hypoglycemia with the basal insulin regimen, but it didn't translate into cardiovascular outcome differences or any other major illness difference. 
Now, back to the hypoglycemia issue. Um, when insulin glargine came uh, to us uh, around the turn of the century, um, it was rather quickly uh, introduced into clinical practice um, and exceeded the expectations of its manufacturers. They thought that since there was no difference in A1C achieved, um, it was not going to be a successful product. But um, it caused a lot less hypoglycemia. And these are, this is um, one of the early studies which shows um, with um, a, a hypoglycemia definition of less than 72 milligram per deciliter or less than 54 milligram per deciliter, there was either a 30% or a 40% reduction in <clears throat> all time of day uh, identified hypoglycemic events, and it was even more of the nocturnal events. This was enough to be noticeable to essentially every patient and every doctor who was prescribing it, and it, it led to the, the um, wide use of this drug. Now, what about um, the newer ones? Are they different from, are they enough different from insulin glargine U100 um, to make them uh, a more attractive option. So here are two summarized side by side, two pooled analyses, one for each drug of um, uh, available studies looking at hypoglycemia risk. The A1C achieved are all, is always the same in these studies, but uh, this is in type 2 diabetes, it was systematically titrated Degladec or systematically titrated Tuzeo. Clargine U300, um, and there was uh, pretty much the same result in, with both of them. There was about 15% fewer hypoglycemic events at any time of day and about 30% fewer at night. Amazingly similar. And the similarity of these two drugs uh, has been reinforced by this recently published head-to-head -head study, the kind we really like, the head-to-head -head trials. Um, comparing Degladec with Juteo um, in type 2 diabetic patients, systematically titrated, very nicely done study. Um, and I'm going to go straight to the bottom line here, um, which is that there were more similarities than differences between these two second generation basal insulin analogs. Um, they both worked great, um, and they, they were not different in, in any respect except for a slightly higher um, uh, dose requirement with Juteo due to slightly lower bioavailability, probably destruction of the insulin under the skin as its long residence time. And that led um, to a small advantage of Tugeo and hypoglycemia risk early in the titration period because the dose was, the titration went a little slower, basically, due to the, the difference in bioavailability. Anyway, the drugs are pretty similar is the bottom line here. And this is just an image showing that A1C reduction, fasting glucose reduction, and 24-hour eight-point profile patterns, they're the same with those two drugs. So the real question then, practically speaking, is for which patients should the primary physician go through the process of fighting with the insurance company and the pharmacy to get their prescription actually filled <laughs> and um, uh, overcome the difficulty uh, when the patient discovers that their copay is higher than they expected for the new, more expensive drug? Now we know a lot about you know, um, U100 glargine. We've done a lot, we've done a lot of studies, and this is an analysis um, of, a, of a collection of them, identifying the, the risk factors for hypoglycemia with systematic titration of this widely used basal insulin. So the ones at the top, younger age use of both metformin and esophenuria and lower attained A1C, are understandable. You would have predicted them. That is, the younger people more often have unrecognized type 1 diabetes, they're more physically active, more hypoglycemia. Use of multiple oral agents is a, is a marker for uh, relatively greater deficiency of basal cell function. Um, and lower A1C is a surrogate for the aggressiveness of titration. So these make sense. On the other hand, lower body mass index was a very strong predictor of hypoglycemia risk and use of a low dose of glargine in this, these studies, uh, either as uh, actual units or units per kilogram, uh, another very strong predictor, low insulin dose, greater risk of hypoglycemia. Now this is not obvious, this is counterintuitive. So why does it happen? And the answer is that the duration of action of all insulins, all insulins, is greater at a higher dose. <laughs> 
and at low doses, the duration is shorter. And this is a study directly done with uh, Levimir, and I don't mean to pick on Levimir, it's just that this is a particularly nice study that shows this phenomenon that is true for all insulins. Um, at low doses, you get less than half the duration uh, that you get at high doses. So the patients who are taking um, low doses of U100 glargine are less likely to get a 24-hour effect, and they're more likely to have peaks and troughs of insulin action and a higher risk of hypoglycemia. So you would think that if you could identify people who are taking, who are going to need low doses, then maybe they should be on the longer-acting newer insulins. And here's uh, support for that theory um, coming directly uh, from a study that was done in Japanese type 2 diabetic patients. A population which routinely requires less than 20 units a day of basal insulin. They're relatively small individuals and relatively non-obese and relatively insulin sensitive, and they don't need very much insulin. And so the difference in the hypoglycemia rates um, in this study, both nocturnal and daytime, was very big, bigger than in the Western studies, the European and American studies. And I think it's due to the dose requirement. And then just putting this in a direct comparison here, um, the, uh, in this Japanese population, <clears throat> uh, the anytime hypoglycemia rate was 36% less with the, with the newer, very long-acting analog. Um, which was an even greater differential than was seen with um, glargine U100 versus NPH in the Western population. So I think clinically significant, clinically significant difference in hypoglycemia in, the, in those patients. And so to summarize again, um, the, the newest, longer-acting basal insulin analogs, glargine U300 and Degladec, are more alike than they are different, and they have a particular advantage over U100 glargine for patients who need less than 25 units uh, of insulin a day, or especially less than 20 units a day. Now, going on finally um, to the prandial problem. Uh, what about when patients are on whatever oral agents they're on, on a GLP-1 agonist or not, have required insulin, and basal insulin has been titrated optimally? and they still have A1C levels that are out of target or considered to be not well enough controlled. What do you do then? And the fact is that we really have only a, a poor idea so far. This is a piece that I wrote, a think piece for diabetes care a, a, a year and a half ago. And th this basically is what it says, that postprandial hyperglycemia remains uncontrolled in most patients with type 2 diabetes and all patients in type 1 diabetes. Oral agents were really not very helpful for the postprandial increment. Um, prandial insulin treatment is limited by weight gain and hypoglycemia, and the weight gain is part of the problem because normal physiologic response to a meal involves a satiety mechanism that stops you from eating too much, and it doesn't work in type 2 diabetes very well. Um, and we need new therapies, and it's a, we, really, we really need some basic science here. Practically speaking, at present, we have really two available options. And the first is what I mentioned earlier, which is a stepwise addition of prandial insulin to basal insulin plus whatever other therapies are being used. Um, but which meal and how do we think about it? How do we practically do it in talking to the patients? Um, and, and the first point I want to make from this proof of concept study is that, um, that these patients group are subgrouped according to whether they themselves identified lunch, breakfast, or dinner as the dominant meal. And they were very good at, at, at doing so. It, they, it, they, their judgment matched that of the investigators and the data. So 30% um, of them had a dominant lunch, 20% had a dominant breakfast, and 50% had a dominant dinner in this American, uh, US, UK, and Russian study population. It was just a three-month study, um, and the A1C hadn't come as down as much as it was going to, but attacking um, the dominant meal, which had been identified by the patient with uh, a dose of insulin and titrated before that meal, uh, reduced the A1C by about 0.3%. And this is another study, longer study done in Italy, uh, where they, they tend to eat uh, at a different time of day. Um, but 
basically the outcome uh, reinforced that of the other study, namely that there was an A1C reduction of 0.4% for attacking the, the dominant meal, the main meal, with a, um, a dose of rapid-acting insulin before that meal. That's what you get for controlling one meal. If you control two meals, you get 0.7 or 0.8. If you control three meals, you get about 1% reduction. But very effective um, with just a single dose. The other option is short-acting GLP-1 agonists, and there are two of them on the market. One is Bietta, short-acting exenatide, which is not being marketed, and the other one is Lixacenatide, which is just a little longer-acting than exenatide, being marketed as a, as a once-a-day longer-acting agent, but it, it's not really as, uh, it's not as long as the other long-acting GLP-1 agonists. And the relevance of that is it has a prandial effect. It has a very strong effect to inhibit um, gastric emptying and slow the rise of glucose after a meal and blunt the postprandial peak. Um, so here are two studies with exenatide. This is against placebo in type 2 diabetes with optimized basal insulin. Um, and what you can see is that the postprandial peak after breakfast and um, uh, dinner, uh, when the injections of the exenatide are given, are markedly blunted. Um, also, there's a big weight difference, three kilogram weight difference. Um, between uh, basal insulin with placebo versus basal insulin with exenatide. And then here's a very nice um, head-to-head -head study, uh, basal insulin titrated, randomized to exenatide twice daily before breakfast and dinner, or three times a day, rapid insulin, um, also titrated. And within the red box, you can see that um, it's basically the same result, slightly favoring um, uh, insulin, but not statistically different really at all. Um, and not only that, huge weight difference, uh, almost a five, ki five, kilogra five kilogram weight difference um, between the insulin uh, treated arm, which gained weight, and the exenatide treated arm, which lost weight. Uh, the drug is not being used this way, but it's out there in the market. It could be used this way. And then another Seattle Portland collaboration here that you've heard about, I know, from Dr. Hirsch and, and Dr. Probesfield was the flat sugar study, which was conceived to test this regimen head-to-head -head against rapid-acting insulin with meals um, in rather difficult-to-treat type 2 diabetic patients, ones with known high cardiovascular risk, known long duration of type 2 diabetes, requiring basal bolus therapy, and um, they were uh, they had a run-in period on basal bolus therapy. That's what's shown the 24-hour profile with my continuous glucose monitoring shown on the left of this slide. And on the right um, is the randomized comparison of exenatide two to three times um, daily versus its baseline. Um, and there's an actual improvement of uh, the glycemic variability with uh, the exenatide regimen compared to basal bolus therapy. Both regimens are extremely effective in this very carefully managed uh, population. These, the, the variability looks bigger than it is here because the, the vertical axis is expanded to show the, to show the variability, actually. Um, the A1C it achieved was very good in this tough population. Uh, and again, there was a gigantic weight differential, five and a half kilograms between the arms. So it's a very promising regimen. It's not been really used properly, and it should be. Maybe the drug companies will manufacture some non-injectable, short-acting GLP-1 uh, analogs, which can be given by nasal uh, or uh, buccal or subcutaneous, uh, I'm sorry, sublingual administration, which will allow us to do this without injections. That would be nice. So just to generally summarize, human insulin still has a place, especially where it matters with cost. If you know how to use it, it's very good for other categories of diabetes treatment as well. Basal insulin is usually better than premixed insulin. I think premixed insulin is overused. If you are going to use premixed, human premixed is not that bad, and it's cheaper. Um, the new basal insulins can reduce hypoglycemia, but they make a difference mainly for the small patients who need low insulin doses. And if you're looking for the right candidate for the more difficult to get, obtain and more expensive drug, it's those low-dose requiring patients, whether they have type 1 or type 2 diabetes.
And finally, for postprandial hyperglycemia, a single mealtime injection of rapid insulin or regular insulin uh, is often enough. I think the short-acting GLP-1 agents need more study. And then just to leave you with something unresolved here, intentionally I'm mentioning the uh, possibility of pramalentide uh, or other amylin analogs that could be used for the same purpose. Um, and I'm giving a conference this afternoon at the endocrine uh, meeting at, uh, at Dr. Hirsch's clinic on pramalentide, if anybody's interested in that. So we're still learning to use insulin. It's not going to go away, despite all the other kind of wonderful new treatments that we have for diabetes, because diabetes, type 2 diabetes and type 1 are both insulin deficiency disorders, and we're still struggling with replacing the insulin. So this is the Columbia River, uh, the boundary line between Oregon and Washington. Thank you for asking me to come to visit you. Okay, we have time. Matt, while we're waiting for people to gather their thoughts for our questions, I have a practical question. I don't know if Jing Chow from our hyperglycemia service is in the audience. But the issue has to deal with, and it comes up more and more due to the increased use of our long-acting basal insulins, our ultra-long-acting basal insulins, when these patients come into the hospital, especially the type 1 patients, but also the type 2, and we don't have these drugs on our formulary, and we probably never will. How, how do we deal with this problem? Mm. Well, a general statement. Everywhere we are struggling with inpatient management of diabetes. We're doing much better ambulatory in the hospital. I don't think we've made very much headway in the last 30 years. It's, it remains a problem. Um, this is a new aspect of the problem. That is, patients are coming into the hospital on drugs that they can't get in the hospital, and the drugs they get in the hospital they may not be able easily to get when they leave the hospital. So this is part of our broken healthcare system. Um, practically speaking, I think in the hospital the best compromise is to use U100 glargine, basaglar, landis, um, as the default insulin because its, it's once daily duration um, gives you an opportunity to manipulate doses in a way that makes sense during the hospital stay. And then they can go back on the, their other insulin when they, when they leave. Um, but Forward-looking, I think we need to find a way to do a better job in the hospital. And if there, if there is an ideal place to test out the new closed-loop um, insulin delivery devices uh, where CGM is linked to a, a smart system for regulating uh, sub-Q or even an intravenous insulin delivery, in hospital would be the place to test it. And I do not understand why no drug companies or device companies done it yet. They should be doing it. Other questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. Wait for the microphone. Can you say a little bit about the, uh, the weight loss with the Zenithide and how sustainable or transient that might be, and also about the cost difference uh, when you add in a Zenithide. Okay, so about Xenotide, cost, sustainability. Right. Well, the weight loss with the GOP-1 agonists is, is uh, rather similar with all the different versions, both the short-acting and the long-acting ones. Um, on starting treatment uh, from a stable baseline with a, a GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist, you tend to get a two to four kilogram uh, weight loss over the first six months, and then it tends to be stable over time. So it's not a continuing weight loss, um, but it's a substantial weight loss. If the alternative treatment is rapid-acting insulin, that's always a weight gain. So the differential is bigger than that two to four kilogram decline. But anyway, it is sustained in general, as long as the patient keeps taking the drug. Um, now, the cost <laughs> is a black box, uh, because uh, uh, the list price uh, of uh, the GLP-1 agonist, just like the list price of new insulins, um, is astronomically high, um, but the health plans uh, reimburse in part for the patients who have health insurance. So it's, it depends on your plan, and it's very hard to get information on what it's going to be until you write the prescription and see the results. This is why the debate going on in Washington right now about drug pricing um, and the um, clarity with which uh, drug prices are 
um, explained to us is such a big deal because it applies not just to insulin, it applies to all of these new drugs like the GLP-1 agonist. Um, Bayeta is particularly difficult because it's not even stocked by a lot of pharmacies. It's so rarely used that it's not widely available. What I put in my talk is, is almost uh, theoretical rather than practical. It's, so, it's, so, it's getting so little use. And the reason in part is that the company um, that manufacture, that owns Bayeta, <laughs> um, which is now off patent by the way, uh, uh, it is uh, trying to sell the long-acting version, not the short-acting version. But the price issues are big, and, and we need to fix them. Anybody else? Oh. One of the pharmacists in my clinic is into putting people on 70-30 or NPH, and then a sulfonylurea 12 hours later. I'm wondering your thoughts on that regimen. Um, it, say it again. I didn't hear the timing. When is the 70-30 given? Um, I think she gives 70-30 at night and then sulfonylurea in the morning. Yes. yes. Oh, I'm so happy to have you say that. <laughs> so back in, just after I wrote that review for the now defunct Western Journal of Medicine on the use of uh, human regular insulin for diabetes, um, I started um, doing uh, early studies of bedtime NPH insulin um, with daytime sulfonylurea, we called it BIDS, bedtime insulin, daytime sulfonylurea. And um, we found early on that the patients who did the best with that were slender. The more obese patients did better if they got 70-30 with dinner instead of NPH at bedtime. And so we published that back in 1982 or something like that. Um, it still works great. And it doesn't have to be analog insulin, it can be human insulin you get a pen injector, which is more convenient with the analog insulin, but it's more expensive. So I think that that, um, I'm so happy to hear that somebody's using it. Some patients do great with 70-30 before dinner and sulfonylurea in the daytime. Sulfonylurea is another story. I don't know if you want to hear about them, but I have strong views on that. And we're going to get, we're going to, we're going to hear about that at the ADA meeting in the Carolina study being reported out, where there's a head-to-head -head comparison of um, uh, non-hypoglycemia uh, uh, causing uh, oral agents versus uh, sulfonylurea, head-to-head -head comparison, linagliptin versus uh, glimepiride. Um, and uh, the, the, the press release that we have um, sh is non-inferiority. They're the same. The, high, the, the outcomes are the, the measured outcomes reported in, the, in the, uh, the short summary in the press release are equivalent. So I'm a, I believe in sulfonylurea still. I think they haven't gone away. Any other questions in the back? Ah, Dr. Young. So my question is, with the um, Credence study, you didn't talk really about SGLT2 inhibitors, but should we now proactively be pulling and putting all of our patients who have albuminuria and early kidney disease on SGLT2 inhibitors? Yeah, it's another huge topic, which uh, I'm going to be talking to cardiology rounds tomorrow, and that's what they're going to want to talk about instead of what I actually am talking about, <laughs> because it's such an exciting possibility. So, right. So the early studies um, uh, of the SGLT2 drugs, all of them, have been done in broad populations of patients as mandated by the FDA so that, uh, you know, those with complications and those without complications are all being exposed to the drug regimen and we discovered that it's safe for everybody. That's the purpose of the, the, the early studies. What I believe will turn out to be true is that the SGLT2 blockers um, will have uh, confirmed favorable protective effects as in Credence, one of the confirmatory studies, um, for patients with type 2 diabetes who have established proteinuria, it will protect against worsening of the proteinuria and decline of the EGFR in those patients. Up to now, we don't have very good evidence that it prevents new onset of proteinuria. Glucose control will do that. Blood pressure control will do that. It doesn't look like the, the SGLT blockers do. But we, all these studies like this that are getting at the nuances are being done. And so that, that's why credence is important. My own view, um, the SGL, SGL, SGLT2 blockers um, are wonderful drugs. They're going to be great for heart failure, um, uh, even occult heart failure, which we haven't been diagnosing. Uh, 
Um, but that's a very late complication of diabetes. It's more often a complication of diabetes than due to something else, by the way, I think. Um, and it's probably going to be protective against worsening of proteinuria. But we haven't defined the exact subgroups of patients where it's going to work yet. It's not going to work for everybody, I don't think. Anybody else? So I have one last question. Um, Matt, the prandial problem, the biggest problem right now, I feel. What is the role, if any, of pulmonary inhaled insulin? What is the role the of? The role. Should, should we be using should more? Should we be of using it? more inhaled insulin? Um, I think, first of all, um, the data with the, the newest formulation is still not very extensive. So objective information we don't have. Um, my guess is it will not get a large fraction of the population, and it probably should not, because we have alternative ways to do it coming along. Um, th there, are, there are unknowns, there are inconveniences. The unknown is, the, is pulmonary, long-term pulmonary risk, either allergic or, or neoplastic or inflammatory. Um, another unknown um, uh, is uh, other cardiovascular type things. So the inconvenience uh, though, has to do with the dosing, it, because you have to uh, add up the right number of packs to deliver the dose. So I think those are such barriers that it, uh, it's not going to be a, a bigger commercial success than it already is now. There'll be a few patients. Everybody has a few patients who really like that. But we've got other ways to go, that's what I think. A related question, Matt. Uh, has the uh, bioavailability of the new preparations for inhaled been resolved as opposed to the previous preparations? There was an issue of availability. Yes. The, the bioavailability is, is better, I believe. Um, again, I, it's not such extensive data as with the earlier uh, formulations. Um, but the real problem is not the bioavailability. Uh, alone. It's the variability in bioavailability, and that's the big question. So, uh, smoke, <laughs> smokers get huge variations in uh, absorption, um, and even secondary smoking may have an effect. And I think that's a, a, a gigantic, for some patients, that'll be a gigantic barrier. Maybe you have some experience with it. I don't have direct experience. It's been interesting because we can see it because of the CGM now, whereas in previous days we couldn't see yeah. it. And at least for, and it's a very select group of patients who really go out of their way to get it, but for those patients who have it, mostly type 1 patients obviously, um, they love it. But the issue is they have to either take it with a rapid acting analog for a higher fat meal or they have to take another dose after they eat. So the convenience issue is, is, is very real, but for those patients who are just glued watching their phone and their CGM, they like it very much. Yeah, so you, you mentioned another inconvenience issue. It's too short for some meals. And uh, in the same way that, that, um, that FIASP, that ra ultra-rapid ASPART, rapid analog, um, is too short. It's too short for dinner for most patients. Um, it's true. We still have some problems. Yes, we do. Okay, with that, I want to thank you again very much. It was a fascinating grand round. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.